I'm Eva Fürst. I'm a co-host of the series Pictures in an Exhibition and also a co-producer of the Art Salon, a series of events in the Pioneer Valley, uh, introducing artists of uh, all kinds of genres. Today we are in the visitor center, Amherst Visitor Center. People will be coming in and out, so don't get disturbed by the distractions. And uh, we are going to have a conversation with Michael Zeid. Michael, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Yes, yes. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to show your work in a public space here and, uh, and to expose uh, your knowledge and your expertise to a wider audience. Thank you. Let, let's just start with the one image that's right behind us. Right. It was, where uh, was it made? Unlike most of the other pictures here, this was Martha's Vineyard, where I lived for 13 years uh, before moving to the valley. Uh, it was April Fool's Day, April 1st, and uh, things were working f out for me as opposed to against me that day. I saw this scene. And it was a, a beautiful moment. Uh, the snow had fallen during the night and coated the trees. So I took out my camera and made use of it. And uh, it's one of my favorite pictures. It's a very interesting photo. First of all, I would never put it into Mantis Vineyard because it's not your standard iconic image of Mantis Vineyard and the ocean. It shows you a completely different quiet scene. And the, and the uh, light and the textures are really unusual. It's interesting that you bring that up because for years, in the 13 years that I was there, the landscape was really my teacher and I had to get a feel for what would serve uh, a collection of photographs of the vineyard. And it is certainly more than waves breaking. Yes, because I think that we, we know this very well. Yes. So what is the unusual part of this image? Can you tell us about that? The light uh, is, is scintillating in some way, if that's uh, the correct word to describe it. There's a quality in the picture uh, because there is snow falling in the background. Uh, it may in, appear a bit grainy, but so much of that is really snow falling. The uh, trees look glazed by ice. It looks all kind of shiny. It, it is, in a sense. It, 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 I don't remember it being shiny, but the light certainly does um, play off of the trees in a beautiful way. During those days, you made mostly black and white images, is it right? I did, I did. Uh, I was also a photojournalist and, uh, uh, and did work for magazines as well. But my own work was usually a large format, 4x5, obviously using film. When you say 4x5, in those right. days it was all film. That's right. uh, and that was the medium I, I chose. But I also did things in, in 35 millimeter in medium format. That was also a time when, uh, when serious photographers used black and white as the media of the color or whatever, the choice. Uh, color photography as a, an artistic use was coming later, shortly afterwards. But until around that time, it was basically black and white for photographers who were taking their, their metier seriously. It's, it's how most of us showed, showed the world off, I think. And form is so much more apparent in black and white colors. A bit of a distraction, but my valley work is all, well, it's not all in color, but it's mostly in color. Yeah. Um, both have their merits, and I enjoy both. Yes, I'm sure, and, and, and it shows. Thank so you. Uh, I would like to move to the next image. It's also in black and white, and it's a very fascinating image that that needs a little bit of an explanation. Oh, the Can pier. You? Yes. The dock. Yes. Um, so we are standing now in front of a really interesting photograph that was also made in Martha's Vineyard. It was during your yes. Martha's Vineyard time, right? Yes. So uh, I'm just looking at it, and there are a gazillion questions coming up. So how did you make that image, and where were you when you did that? I was standing in the surf. Um, <laughs> I always wore fireman's boots uh, on Martha's Vineyard uh, because I was often walking into the water. Uh, one of the things I like to do is put the tripod further in than the edge of the than the edge of the water because it was a better perspective for yeah. what I was doing. Sure. And that picture um, was. Mm -hmm. uh, probably took about 15 minutes to make, and it, it is comprised of, of 30 separate exposures wow. on one sheet of film. Um, in those days, I preferred to use a 4x5 camera, always on a tripod, uh, and the sheet film can take as many exposures as you have energy to keep cocking the shutter and releasing it. 
And this particular picture uh, I saw as somewhat misty, foggy, to add another layer of interest. So the separate exposures added that sense of movement as well as mistiness uh, that I thought really caught the moment the way I wish to show it. It's also a very unusual angle. And at first you have to kind of figure out where you are. And if you've never stood underneath a dock, you would not even know what it is. Well, <laughs> this, this brings to mind an incident. I, I always wore fireman's boots when I was going into the water. That was part of my standard apparel. Uh, on one occasion, I turned my back on an oncoming wave and paid the price. And everything ended up going into the brink. Cameras lenses, everything Fan. you can imagine. And one thing I learned was, as long as you keep what went into the salt water in fresh water until you get it to the repair shop, you have a very good chance of salvaging everything. Did you? I did. I Excellent. did. I took the ferry with a bucket of water across to Falmouth, and they, they took, took what I had, and they uh, salvaged it. And it was as good as new. Very nice. Got good lucky. to know that. Got lucky. So this, you know, being in the water, is uh, something that you told me a little story about, and I would like to bring this up now. You grew up, you grew up in Los Angeles, yes. is this correct? Yes. And you were on the beach. You were telling me about a story uh, when you were a child and there was a snowstorm? That, that was a major moment for me. It's, yes, it's, re us. it's referred to in the Los Angeles Times of that day, which is... I think it's, I'm trying to remember, January 11th, 1945, which kind of dates me. But um, it's referred to as the first historic snowfall in Los Angeles. Um, I woke up for some reason, and it was uh, sunrise. I walked over to the window. It was absolutely silent. I don't know what caught my attention. But everything outside looked as if it was coated in pure gold. And I was uh, five years old, a lover of things gold, and I actually thought it was gold. Um, in some ways, it really affected me so deeply that I really attribute my observations, my attention, and my enjoyment of the natural world to that moment. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was more than a snowfall. It was a, uh, a life-changing moment, as it turned out. It's interesting because when you're talking about the gold, I, have, I can totally visualize this beautiful, rich visual experience. Yeah. And, uh, and it kind of influences you in terms of nature. And uh, you see this nature already in your images from Martha's Vineyard. But you also see them in the images you're making now here in the Pioneer Valley, where you have done some very interesting work with, um, with atmospheric images of the nature around you. But you've also um, uh, made some really interesting technical choices in terms of exposure and, and, and nighttime images. And, uh, and it lets you, actually, to teaching. Is that correct? Well, uh, when we moved here, my <laughs> wife and I, in 1982, um, I was really looking for uh, a way of seeing the valley uh, in my own way as opposed to ways that, uh, as, as opposed to pictures that you would see commonly uh, or more commonly. Uh, and really the transition happened years later um, when I met Richard Little, who is a retired professor of geology, a wonderful fellow. Uh, we had a discussion, and he ended up writing a preface for the, the forthcoming book on, on the valley for me. And he really instilled in me a love of the, the valley as a primal force, uh, hearkening back to the days of dinosaurs and those geological transformations that, that made this valley look the way it does. Yeah. Um, I see it as it was. Uh, I, like to in, I like to use mist. Morning mist is probably when it's most viable to see and, and photograph. Uh, in a lot of the photographs, because it reminds me of this primal, primal valley at a time when um, people had not yet been invented. Uh, and, the, and the landscape was dotted by the, the tracks of dinosaurs who were roaming this way and that. Right. So here we are 
still at the visitor center, <laughs> yeah. now in front of a whole array of wonderful places to go, including the Henyan Bakery, which is not advertised, but it is one of the most wonderful images of a local beloved spot. Well, thank you. So we are now looking at landscapes in the Pioneer Valley, um, away from Martha's Vineyard. Now, uh, Michael is uh, photographing with color, and he is catching that primeval idea of, uh, of an ancient landscape. Thank you. Yes, that, that really is how I see it. It's a personal vision, I suppose, that uh, I'm stuck with. I can only see the valley in that way at this point. Uh, one thing I've also found, which you may find humorous, but it's so true, one of the most important things I think any landscape photographer can have is a dog that needs walking. <laughs> I can't tell you how many incredible shots I've gotten only because she had to be walked. I never would have been outside at that moment. Including that elk in your backyard? Uh, not, yes, in, in a sense, including the elk, because she, she did sniff it out. Uh, and all of a sudden, there was an elk who was trying to get a few winks in, a few, a few mm -hmm. moments of sleep in. My dog interrupted that. Uh, eventually, the elk walked down the street and ended up in my front yard, started nibbling our apple trees, trying to get I'm not quite sure what elks like to eat, but uh, I took out my camera, I took out my tripod, and said, just hold that pose. And <laughs> the elk was wonderful. Uh, people warned me, stay away from their hooves. Yeah. They can kick in every direction. Yeah. So uh, we made friends, and um, I, I, it was the most enjoyable experience. I had never seen an elk that close before. So this image right behind us here, to me, has a, a different connotation that would, would uh, surprise me to think of as an image from the Pioneer Valley because of its color tonation, tonal, its tonal representation. Uh, it is uh, a, a, a very almost dusty feeling rather than misty. And uh, it could be somewhere in a savannah in Africa, mm. but it is in the Pioneer Valley, and yes. uh, and it's a it's a really uh, moody pho photograph. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, when, when you see a, a place that you've lived in now for almost forty years, uh, it, it reminds me of um, an Elliot Erwood, who is a wonderful photographer. A quote by by him: "I think the job of photography is to see the uncommon in the commonplace," and basically. If you are out and about looking with intention, sooner or later you're going to find moments that lend themselves to what it is you're hoping to find. And that's just what you do as an edu educator, correct? You are teaching people how to be personal and exactly. how to see anew with a, with a different kind of a, a, a way of seeing. Absolutely. The goal is to somehow find a way of seeing in a personal vein, yeah. something that only you uh, would be responsible for, and hopefully it would open the eyes of, of the audience to an, another, another view, another way of seeing the world that they might not have thought possible or certainly would have glossed over and passed by. Right. So another view altogether is another image behind us, which is a really interesting nighttime uh, a view, a photo of an apple tree. And, uh, and this apple tree is uh, lit in the most interesting way by the stars and by something else. So tell us about that. <laughs> we, uh, we moved here uh, and actually built a house on top of a hill that was formerly all apple orchards. So we have an apple orchard in our front yard. Um, I was actually testing out uh, a different brand camera that was very good for night vision, long exposures in the dark. Uh, and I went out into, into the front yard on a starry night, and that's the picture that I walked away with. It's surprising how close to home you can find things of interest, uh, and especially in the valley, because the weather is constantly changing, and the scenes are constantly affected by that change in weather. We are all influenced by Emily Dickinson one way or the other, aren't we? <laughs> I suppose so. You know, the, the, the saying is make, make your photographs as if they were poetry. And uh, poetry has that effect on people, and that's what your photographs hopefully 
will affect people in that same way. This concludes our conversation with Margaret Seid at the Amherst Visitor Center. And the exhibition is up to the end of this month, which is January. So you have a whole month of January to see these wonderful images. Thank you very much.